Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, 12th lecture on 3D coordinate system. Um, today I will show you how to estimate the parameters of a 3D similarity um, based on a maximum likelihood estimation. So the maximum likelihood estimation of the parameters of the similarities uh, lead to an iterative solution. Because we have a nonlinear Gauss Markov model, the observations are nonlinear, uh, dependent on the parameters. Um, the, uh, we show that with a uh, simplified stochastical model, we can find the covariance matrix of uh, the direct solution, which will, I will show in more detail last, next time. And um, finally, I will show you how to estimate uh, the uh, 3D similarities with a full covariance buttress. So it's uh, the task is you have given here points in one system and um, uh, they are observed in another system, um, translated, rotated and scaled. And the task is to estimate the similarity between these two point clouds. So before I start, I would like to summarize uh, what, uh, how to solve a nonlinear Gauss-Markov model. So the model is the following. Um, we have the stochastical variable L from which we sample. We assume it is normally distributed with the mean being a fixed function of uh, the fixed values X and some covariance matrix sigma LL. We assume that L is observed, um, that the function f is given. That means we assume that it is also differentiable um, and the covariance matrix is given. And the task is to find that x which minimizes the maximum likelihood. So because we assume the Gaussian distribution um, in the exponent, we have the negative of this uh, quadratic form. So we have to max minimize this uh, optimization function omega of x with respect to x. And um, you see that we have here the residuals multiplied with the inverse covariance matrix multiplied with the residuals. So we uh, minimize the weighted sum of the residuals. The problem is nonlinear in general. So we have to iterate. Um, therefore, we need approximate values in general. And then we derive a linear substitute problem, what we call it, uh, which has the form of a Gauss Markov model. And then after iteration, we get uh, best approximations. And these we take as um, estimates um, of the optimization problem. So in detail, we have the following uh, iterative solution. We start with providing approximate values for the parameters x, a, a standing for approximate. And then in an iterative uh, manner, we improve these approximate values. By first deriving this uh, linear substitute problem, which is then linearized observations, which we discuss immediately. And they are assumed to be normally distributed and in a linear fashion, depending on the changes of the approximate values and the same covariance matrix. We solve this problem in the classical way, for instance, using the normal equation system. Here we have the normal equation matrix at the right hand side. This would be one possibility. Then we update the approximate values with some function which we have to define, this update function, depending on the previous approximate values and the just estimated um, corrections. And we get new approximate values. And if these corrections are too large, we uh, continue iterating and otherwise we stop the iteration. After this process, we take the last approximate values after convergence as our estimates for our original problem. And then we can derive possibly quality measures, for instance, the covariance matrix of these estimates. Some comments. Sometimes it's very hard to obtain approximate values. If I wouldn't tell you how to get approximate values for that problem, you would have to sit down and think about it. And they're a harder problem than the similarity transformation. 
this linear substitute problem we just obtained by Taylor expansion. So we do the following. We take the nonlinear Gauss-Markov model, we linearize the function at the approximate values plus the Jacobian of this function with respect to the unknown parameters evaluated at our approximate values. And now we put the f of xa on the other side so we get delta L minus f xa. This is the difference between our observations and the observations which would be obtained if we would know that the unknown parameters are the approximate values. This we call delta L plus V, this stays, and then we have left here A multiplied with the delta X. So this is our linear substitute problem in the form of a Gauss-Markov model. Um, then we determine these corrections. Uh, usually we correct the, uh, the approximate values additively, sometimes as we have seen multiplicatively, so that's the reason why I uh, talked about uh, the update function here. Um, the update depends on uh, which type of problem you have. And you sometimes wouldn't like to do it additively. Um, the termination of the iteration usually t takes the ratios of all the individual corrections of the parameters divided by some approximate standard deviation which you might know. We come to that back uh, later. And um, we then, at the end, if we have reached convergence, we transfer the uncertainty from the, non, uh, the linear substitute problem to the uh, nonlinear original problem, assuming that the uncertainty transfers so because we have only relatively small uh, deviations. Otherwise, this would not be allowed. So, let's look at the Gauss-Markov model for the 3D similarity model. What do we have? We get the approximate values from the direct solution. So this is fine. This of course assumes we have no outliers. Then we derive the substitute problem and we have multiple corrections for the scale rotation. We obtain a normal equation system of 7 by 7 for the 7 parameters. We update the parameters, the translation additively, the scaled rotation multiplicatively. We usually, in this setting, need only two or three iterations. If you have this problem and the stochastical model would be identical to that, what we use that for this uh, direct solution, that means the simplified model with isotropic uncertainty and each point is individually weighted, then of course we probably would not iter need to iterate at all. So already the first iteration would show that the approximate values be would be fine. Uh, if this is not the case, then we usually need two, perhaps three. If you need more, something is wrong. And then we do a variance propagation at the end. So, how does it look like? We start with the functional model, which is uh, the observa ob individual observations plus the residuals. This is a nonlinear function for this uh, observational vector, depending on x, or written in our application notation. We have the uh, observed coordinates plus the residuals. is the translation vector plus the scale multiplied with the rotation uh, applied to the given coordinates. So, now we assume that the approximate values for the parameters are given by some approximate rotation, some approximate translation, and some approximate scale parameter. Where we get it from is not described here and is not the discussion here. Then, as soon as we have done the updates, the estimates, we get the updates. So we multiply the approximate rotation with a small rotation depending on the estimated parameters delta r. Now you see the relation between the model which we have. Actually, I should here have curly brackets because this is a matrix and these are vectors, so this is certainly not consistent. So it should be a set 
of um, three values. The translation is uh, corrected additively and the scale, I talk about this later, is also updated by the exponential of this small uh, estimated scale change. We could do it this, in this way individually or we could uh, get the new approximate uh, transformation by taking the old approximation multiplied with the small similarity depending on the uh, seven estimated parameters. We linearize by uh, taking the Jacobians and we did this in a previous lecture. So we have here the linear substitute model in the notion, uh, notation of the uh, estimation theory and here in the notation of the application. Um, uh, the linearized observations, that means the linearized coordinates um, are the given coordinates, the, the, the observed coordinates, minus those coordinates which we would get if we transform the given coordinates with the approximate values. So this is the given point xi, apply the similarity to it, and that's the reason why there stands a prime, because it's now in the coordinate system of the prime system, the observing system, and it depends on these approximate values, so there we, therefore we have an A here. The parameters of this linearized optimization problem are the change of the rotation vector, the change of the translation vector, and the change of the scale. And the Jacobian, as we have derived it in a previous lecture, is nothing else than the negative skew symmetric matrix of the um, approximate values for the transformed point, the unit matrix for the translation, and the vector itself for the scale. So this is uh, the um, linearized substitute model. And now we Assume we have a simplified stochastic model to see what happens if we um, use centroid, uh, central coordinates. So we assume that each point has an individual coordinate matrix, which is nothing else than a scaled unit uh, matrix. And each point has a different standard deviation, that means an individual weight. We use centered coordinates, that means we subtract the centroids which we in this case uh, estimate by um, taking the weighted average of all the coordinates in both systems. So the nonlinear model in the central form, we just subtract the centroids from the observed values and the centroid from the uh, given coordinates. And then instead of having t, we have here a t in the centroid system. So this, this, t, this t in the central system is a different one than before. So we could also say these are the centered coordinates observed, and these are the centered coordinates given, and uh, this is our similarity transformation. So this is quite uh, uh, intuitive. Now, we argue because we know a little bit. We know that the translation probably is zero, which we haven't proved at this place. Previously we found it. So we assume that the translation vector in this estimation is zero. So the approximate value for this translation in the centered coordinate is assumed to be zero. The linearized model, of course, looks the same way as before, except that we have here uh, always uh, the C left upper index to indicate that the data are uh, referring to the centered coordinates. And now we see that the uh, approximate values for the transformed points are nothing else than the given point multiplied with the rotation and the scale because we assume that the translation in this centered system is zero. So this is a simplifying example, uh, 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 assumption, which we will use uh, later. Okay, how does the 
uh, normal equation matrix look like. It's just uh, the A transpose uh, weight matrix mul multiplied with A or the sum of the transposed individual design matrices for each point with uh, A itself weighted, summed over all points. And we, if we multiply this out, we observe the following. We get the sum over all points of the weighted product of s and minus s, or s and s transposed. We first do the diagonal terms. Then we get the sum over all the weights. That's this one. And then we get the sum over the transposed transferred given coordinates multiplied with itself. So, this is, so to say the length of that vector. We will interpret this vector later. Now let's have a look at the off-diagonal terms. So this is the sum over the weighted sum over all skew-symmetric matrices weighted with Wi. Now each individual skew-symmetric matrix contains the individual coordinates. So if we sum all these, we get a skew-symmetric matrix with entries being the sum of the individual coordinates. Because these coordinates are centered, their sum is zero. So we get a zero matrix here. The second is here, this element, the one three element, is the sum over the skew symmetric matrices of this vector multiplied with the vector. And because this is the cross product of this vector with itself, it's also zero. And finally, we get the sum over all the coordinates, which again is zero. This shows that the resulting normal equation matrix, 7 by 7, is a block diagonal matrix. Here we have a single element, a scalar. Here we have a single element, a scalar. And we have here a 3 by 3 block uh, matrix. So this is one 3 by 3 block, which uh, doesn't simplify in general. So, but, but this, of course, eases the calculation. So the right-hand side, we have a look at the same thing. So we get the sum of the Jacobian transposed multiplied with the um, linearized observations. What are the linearized observations? That are the uh, observed coordinates, centered, minus the predicted coordinates. Now, this element is nothing else than the original coordinates minus the centroid. So the sum over all these coordinates is zero. The second is that this is the approximate, the, the transferred given points with approximate values, which is nothing else than the given points minus its, the centroid multiplied with r and lambda. And if you sum that up, we get the sum of all the xi's, and this is uh, weighted uh, identical to xc, so this weighted sum also will be zero. That means the second term in this vector is zero. Aha, this is good, because we expected that the translation in the centered problem this, uh, the, the coordinates centered to um, the, the centroids, that this translation is zero. This is actually what we obtain from the direct solution. And this is confirmed here using a totally different approach. This shows that the um, two solutions, at least at this point, are exactly the same. So the estimated translation is zero, and we will come to, back to this later. So now we have to update the parameters. We start with the scale factor. So we have the scale approximate value for the scale factor. We have the estimates from the linear substitute model. And we multiply this approximate scale 
with uh, one plus uh, this small correction and to get a, uh, improved approximate values. Now how does it look like? Um, we take the uh, estimate as the ratio of this term which is the transferred given coordinates into the uh, observed coordinate system using the approximate values multiplied with the linearized observation and divide by this term of the normal equation matrix um, and uh, we see that this is nothing else than the square of the length of this vector. Now we have to be careful when we do this update because if you have good, very good approximate values, nothing will happen. Um, but if you have bad approximate values for the scale, it might be that the change which we get in this, it, especially in the first iteration, might be large. It may be negative. It may be even below 1. Now, if it is below 1, we get as a factor here a negative value that means the updated scale factor would be negative which is of course not very good. Therefore I recommend to approximate the 1 plus x here the change of the delta L um, by the exponential of x which for small values of course is uh, a good approximation and uh, we replace this update rule with 1 plus delta lambda by uh, e power delta lambda multiplied with the approximate value. And because the exponential always leads to positive values, we have a guarantee that the new approximation um, for the scale factor is positive. Observe that we do here the, exactly the same as we do for the rotations. Here we have the approximate rotation matrix. We multiply it with the exponential of a skew-symmetric matrix of our uh, estimated rotation parameters, so we have a guarantee that here this matrix is a rotation matrix, so the product again is a rotation matrix. So um, this is very similar and this is uh, what I recommend. Now we do the update of the rotation matrix. I have written down here in the classical form. And here we need to solve a 3 by 3 system. What is the right hand side? This is H, the first element refers to the rotation. This is the sum of the skew symmetric matrices multiplied with the linearized observations and divided by this matrix or this matrix as partial normal equation system. So we have to solve this equation system 3 by 3, which is simple. And then we can take this delta r and update our rotation. And finally we get the estimated translation parameter from this classical relation which we discussed earlier. Um, and we don't have to take the translation estimate into account because we know this is zero. So we don't have problems here and don't need to go into the um, uh, estimation. This refers, this translation refers to the original system and because R and lambda also are identical between the centered and the non-centered system, we have solved our problem. Okay, how does the algorithm look like? I have sh show, show you here a MATLAB implementation. So we have a function which uh, leads uh, us to the estimated uh, similarity. We start with uh, coordinates x which are uh, given. Then we have here the transformed coordinates xt. Here approximate for the rotation. Here approximation for the uh, scale parameter lambda and the number of iterations. Here's some description. So the x is a horizontal matrix with all the three vectors put into a long matrix. The same for xt. And r0 is a 3 by 3 matrix, l0 is a scalar, and n, n iterates is just the number of iterations. So we start. We first determine how many points we have. Then we uh, transfer these coordinates into homogeneous coordinates by uh, putting a 1 in the last row, same for here, 
and we estimate the mean of these um, uh, big matrices with respect to the second index. That means we have to take the mean row-wise, that therefore this 2. And then we subtract the mean, of course only the first three elements, from the x and the same for the xt, and we get here the centered coordinates x and the centered transformed coordinates. These are uh, our observations. And then we have the initial uh, similarity. You see here we just multiply L0 with R0. And here is the uh, initial value for the translation, which, because we work in the centroid system, is 0. OK, now we start itera iteration. Um, we first determine the transformed given points. So these are the centered given points multiplied with a0. This is the reason why I work with homogeneous coordinates in order to have this simplified in, in terms of notation here in the program. Um, so this is what we need for the Jacobians. And then we set up three elements which are zero at the beginning and which are then added up. We have these sums, so we set these sums to zero at the beginning here for the normal equation system, three by three for the rotation, for the right hand side for the rotation estimation, and then we have the sum to sums for this scale estimation the, for the z and uh, the denominator. And then we, for each point, increase these sums. So the first is we take the Jacobian for the rotation, which is nothing else than minus the, the skew-symmetric matrix of this vector, which is this one, of point i. Then we increase the normal equation matrix, 3 by 3, by this uh, expression. Then we increase the right hand side by a transposed uh, residuals. And um, we sum up, uh, increase the sums. So as soon as we have built our normal equation system, we can directly derive the change of the rotation vector, which is. Uh, uh, the solution of this uh, equation system, we get the updated rotation matrix by multiplying the given rotation matrix, the approximate rotation, multiplied with the rotation based on this small value, which is actually the realization of the exponential. Then we have the update of the scale, original scale, multiplied with the exponential of the ratio, and we finally get the new transformation, which is still translation 0, with L0 and R0. And that's, that's all. So, now we are at the end of the iterations and provide the final results. The only thing what we need to do is to estimate the translation, which is nothing else than the uh, me, the center um, of our given coordinates updated by the uh, centroid multiplied with rotation and uh, scaling of the given coordinates. And then we finally get the similarity, which is then L0, R0. And now we really have here a vector, which we want to have in our final result. OK, this algorithm doesn't show three things, at least. We have no criterion for stopping the iterations. So in this case, it's very transparent. We only have corrections for the scale, and we only have corrections for the rotation parameters. The scale is unitless and the rotation parameters are also unitless. So we could assume that if we have higher accuracy, if the change of these parameters is smaller than a threshold, we are fine. So we take the maximum of these changes 
and check whether they are smaller than t, let's say t is 10 power minus 6. Uh, we would like to give out the residuals and we probably would like also to have uh, some uncertainty measures for the result. Okay, now what happens if we have a full covariance matrix? Not this simplified model. What happens? Okay, we have nothing else than the normal equation of this kind that we can't simplify. So it will not be block diagonal anymore in general. And the right hand side also. There will be no zero for the translation. And um, we again will use the centered coordinates and um, for the translation. That means we take some centroid. It doesn't really matter which one. Of course, we take the one which is probably very good, which is the weighted center of all the coordinates. So we take the sum of all the weighted coordinates. W is a 3 by 3 matrix multiplied with the coordinates. And here we have the sum of all these weight matrices in worse. So this is, so to say, the solution of the weighted mean if the individual vectors which we want to average uh, have a covariance matrix which is not diagonal. Then we take the centroid coordinates and we just have to substitute uh, the corresponding values here by their centered version. So the transformed given coordinates uh, need to be calculated in the centroid coordinates. The linearized observations need to be calculated in the centered coordinate. And uh, we should have the centered uh, translation parameter, which in general will not be zero anymore. So the update then is nothing else than the rotation multiplied with the small rotation, the translation, plus the estimated translation, which will be small, but not zero, and the update of the scale parameter. And this gives us the estimates. And um, the estimated in the original system is nothing else than this estimate in the centered system, plus this correction term due to the centroids which we applied uh, to calculation, calculating our centered coordinates. So, this is what I wanted to show you. And for those who like quaternions, is the question, could we have done everything with quaternions? And that's, so to say, something which you might uh, follow or you just stop here. So. The first thing is that we have to derive a, a sim simple expression for the 3D similarity using quaternions. We start with the following. We assume that the given coordinates and the observed coordinates are transformed in quaternions. So these are now quaternions. Their scalar part is zero. So we have pure quaternions. The unknown parameters are, of course, the translation, which is a pure quaternion. So we have here the translation vector, which is unknown, and scalar part is zero. And the scaled rotation is an unconstrained quaternion. So it's not a unit quaternion, but an arbitrary quaternion. So it has a scalar part and a vector part. And if we take the length of this quaternion, as scale, uh, as scale parameter and take here the unit quaternion q normalized with its length, we actually arrive at an expression which has here the cosine of the half of the rotation angle and here sine of the half of the rotation angle multiplied with r. And we multiply with the square root of lambda. Why? Because if we multiply our given coordinates from the left and the right with q and the conjugate of q, which is then taking the negative of q, we get first this part, the rotation part. That means we get a rotation. And we get a scaling by the square root of lambda squared. So with lambda, which is fine. So the model 
for the similarity in 3D can be written down in quaternions with this expression. So we have the translation quaternion plus the product of the given coordinates multiplied from the left and the right with the quaternion and its uh, conjugate. So this is, so to say, the um, description in quaternion form. Now we take this and write it down in matrix form. Still thinking of quaternion. So we have the scaled rotation matrix. So we put lambda and r in one unit, which, is, which I call q. So instead of having t plus lambda r x, we have now t plus q multiplied with x. Now, how is q represented? Now, we assume that we represent the rotation using a quaternion. You remember we have this big expression normalized with the length squared of the quaternion. Now, we multiply this matrix with this norm square of the quaternion so that actually this Q has this form, no deno uh, uh, denominator. So the scaled rotation, Q, is represented by an arbitrary quaternion and explicitly it has this form. Now, remember, we said that if you represent a rotation with a quaternion, then you can scale it arbitrarily. Why? Because if you scale it with whatever some factor, let's say k, then we normalize with uh, k's uh, in the uh, denominator. Now here we don't normalize anymore, so this quaternion is no homogeneous vector anymore in this sense, because it doesn't represent a rotation, but a scaled rotation. So we obtain the nonlinear model our observed coordinates plus residuals is the transformation plus the scaled rotation multiplied with the coordinates. Now you see here we have uh, non-homogeneous coordinates in, in this equation. Now look, this looks exactly in its structure similar to what we did in 2D. We have here the, in 2D the uh, observed 2D coordinates plus the corrections, the translation vector, which we called R in this, uh, context, in this context, plus the Z matrix, which is the scaled rotation multiplied with the given coordinates. The scaled rotation, you remember, was this matrix AB and minus BA. So the scaled rotation in 2D looks this way, and the scaled rotation in 3D looks this way. The difference is here it's linear, here it's quadratic. Okay. Now, we would like to do a maximum right estimation of a nonlinear Gauss Markov model. So we have to do iterations and we have to linearize in some way and do some update. And in this case, we also update the unknown parameters, the translation additively, and the scaled rotation multiplicatively. So let's assume we have an approximate value for the scaled rotation, quaternion. We multiply it from the left with 1 plus some quaternion s, which we assume is small and estimated in the procedure. Or written down in matrices, we have here the scaled rotation depending on our approximate quaternion multiplied with a scaled rotation which depends on 1 plus the small quaternion s. The general scaled rotation looks the following. So we get the scaled rotation q as a function of the quaternion q, which is this expression which we know and used for the case of unit quaternions for representing a rotation. Now we don't have this normalization, so we don't normalize this expression by the length of q and we assume q is arbitrary. And 
that means a small scale rotation is nothing else than Q instead of depending on this quaternion Q, depending on 1 plus S. And if you write this out, we get here the scalar part squared minus the scalar product of the vector part multiplied with the unit matrix plus two times the scalar part multiplied with the skew symmetric matrix plus two times the dyadic product of the vector part. And now we linearize. This is qu quite simple. We just collect all the terms except the quadratic terms. So we have here 1 times the unit matrix, which is this one. Then we have here 1 plus s square, which is 1 plus 2s plus s square, so 2s multiplied with the unit matrix, which is this one. The s square we don't take into account because we linearize. This also is square, so we don't take this into account. Then we have here 2 times the skew symmetric matrix, which is this one plus 2 times s multiplied with the symmetric matrix, uh, q, uh, skew symmetric matrix of uh, our vector part. This is quadratic in s, so we don't take this, and this is anyway quadratic. So we have the linearized scaled rotation written down in this form. Aha, okay, this uh, looks simple. So now we linearize this model. So we first take the approximately transformed points. So we take the given points, multiply them with the scaled rotation and add the approximate value for the translation and get the uh, approximate positions of our ob observed points. Then we have the linearized observations, which are nothing else than the given observations minus these predicted uh, coordinates. And we have the linearized model which is the delta x prime, which is this one, plus the residual equals the change of the coordinates of uh, the translation. And then we have this linear part here, this part, multiplied with our coordinates, transformed coordinates, which is some Jacobian AI transposed multiplied with the change of delta t and the change of the scaled rotation. So now let's have a look at the linearized model. I copied this equation from the previous slide. Um, and uh, we have this expression on the right hand side, delta t plus this expression for the uh, Jacobian of the scaled rotation multiplied with the coordinates gives at the end, what we want to know is some design matrix AI transpose multiplied with the corrections delta t and the change of the scaled rotation quaternion. Now, if we look at what happens here, we of course have the change of the delta t. Um, the Jacobian, of course, is a unit matrix I3. Um, the second uh, factor is two times the unit matrix multiplied with the coordinates, this is this part, multiplied with delta s, which is the scalar part of our estimated small quaternion. And the third part is two times the cross product of the vector part of our quaternion multiplied with the coordinates, which then leads to the negative cross product of the coordinates with the vector part of our quaternion. That means we obtain a Jacobian, which is uh, of size 3 times 7, with the unit matrix here, and a 3 by 4 matrix, Y, depending on our transformed uh, uh, given coordinates. And um, we get, obviously, the same structure as in the 2D case. Remember, we had here the um, Jacobian uh, being the unit matrix for the translation, and here the z matrix of the uh, transformed coordinates. And um, remember that the z matrix was of the structure x, let's say AB or XY, and here the corresponding orthogonal part. And you see this repeats here in the 3D case. Here we have the coordinates x in 3D and minus the skew symmetric matrix for the rotation part. And uh, these are orthogonal to each other because uh, the cross product is zero.
So this um, shows that we have a quite uh, uh, similar structure in the 3D as we have in the 2D. We are now finished with the Jacobian and I just want to show how this relates to the classical representation if we take lambda and the rotation vector theta. So the scale factor is the length of the quaternion which we estimate. And this correction of the scale 1 plus delta lambda is the length of 1 plus ds. ds is the small estimated um, quaternion from the estimation. So the relation to the small factor 1 plus d lambda and the rotation vector d theta is the following. So let's rewrite it. So we have here 1 plus ds is nothing else than the product we first have to rotate by a small rotation and then multiply with a small scale parameter, here the square root, because we have here this square. So we have here the quaternion with the square root of 1 plus d lambda and 0, and here 1 and the small rotation vector, half. And if you multiply this out, we get 1 plus now here 1 plus the delta lambda, if we take the square root, we get 1 plus a half d lambda because we have to take the differential of uh, the square root. And then we get here 1 and a half d theta. So this is just taking that this is a scalar and we ex replace the square root by the linearized version. And then we multiply these two quaternions, we get 1 plus half of delta lambda and half of d theta. Aha, that means 1 plus ds is nothing else than 1 plus half d lambda plus and half d theta. So the change of our ds in our quaternion representation corresponds to half of the change of the scale change in our classical representation and the half of the angle um, in our classical representation. Which is very nice because we just have this factor which we know from rotations transferred from delta theta to quaternions with half of the uh, angle for small angles. It also transfers to the uh, scale. And that means in the classical representation we would get the uh, linearized equation is this Jacobian multiplied with delta t and now delta s and this is now delta lambda and delta theta. We put that together in the same manner as before and we have the Jacobian um, of course for the translation here and the coordinates and the minus uh, of the skew symmetric matrix which we know from our previous lectures and if we write that down we get the following comparison. So the Jacobian which we derived previously was nothing else than the negative skew symmetric matrix for the rotation for the translation and the scale or this form which you might also remember with the skew symmetric matrix, the unit matrix and the um, vector itself. And so except for the sorting, this matrix and this matrix are exactly the same. That means we could have derived the Jacobian also using the quaternion setup and then go back to our lambda and theta and correct it. So this closes uh, this lecture. Uh, what I showed you, we sh discussed a general solution for arbitrary covariance matrix, um, especially assuming that we have anisotropic uncertainty of the coordinates. We use centroids, but not because we expect the translation to be zero, but only for numerical reasons, which we discussed last time. And of course this is required, this uh, solution, if you want to do testing of the residuals or for deformations or changes of the similarities. Because we can derive a covariance matrix, which I will discuss next time. And we looked at the specific solution for the isotropic uncertainty. And um, this then gives us the possibility to have the uncertainty for the direct solution. And I showed you how to 
set up the whole model and the linearization using quaternions, which might be interesting. So this closes uh, this lecture. Uh, next time we will have a look at the uncertainty analysis, especially the coherence matrices of our uh, estimates, and uh, we'll have a look how to use uh, the statistical tools which are available for evaluating our uh, approach. Thank you very much.